Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. And uh, tonight we're very excited. We're going to have a wonderful presentation by Professor uh, Danny Kim from Cal State Fresno, and he'll be discussing the uh, model minority myth. And this is part of the series, uh, the webinar series for Friends of Korea. We've been trying to focus on the Asian American experience this year. And for members that may be new uh, to what we're doing here, uh, Friends of Korea started off as an organization for returned Peace Corps volunteers, but has since expanded to include members across continents and all age demographics. The only requirement is for you to have a very uh, an interest in all things Korea. So we're hoping you'll enjoy uh, tonight's session. And uh, Professor Kim, as I've said, is at Cal State Fresno. He's a, an assistant professor there. And his interests are in modern Korea, modern Japan, East Asia, gender and feminism, uh, Korean and Japanese socialism, and Korean literature. And he has also been a Fulbright scholar in Korea. So without further ado, Professor Kim. Yeah, so uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, attend this talk with Friends of Korea. Um, since we did have quite a few more registered, um, I assume that we'll have others trickling in, but um, we can go ahead and get started either way. So um, the subject of this conversation uh, revolves around the model minority myth, and uh, the title of the talk is Historicizing the Model Minority Myth, a Cold Word History. And uh, in many ways, this is a timely discussion, as we had um, an excellent talk by Connie chung jo, uh, representing Asian Americans Advancing Justice. And uh, she outlined some of the challenges that uh, the Korean American community is facing today. Uh, for example, there's a lot of um, recent uh, violence and discrimination against the Asian American communities uh, that was connected to um, the recent pandemic. And uh, one of the challenges that um, uh, Connie chung jo, um spoke about was the so-called model minority myth. Um, so I would actually like to uh, think of it as not the model minority myth, but rather the model minority paradox. Now, why is it a paradox? Um, well, honestly speaking, the whole idea of the model minority uh, myth is, is strange. On the one hand, um, uh, Asian Americans, including Korean Americans, are celebrated as a group who has had great success achieving the American dream. You know, um, Korean Americans are, are seen as an um, a ethnic group, a nationality that has done well in assimil assimilating to American culture and becoming a part of the American tapestry. Uh, so this is a narrative that you are doubtlessly aware of, um, but this image from Time Magazine uh, gives you a sense of this myth. Um, you know, it's Time Magazine. It, it shows this uh, stereotypically uh, successful Asian American quote unquote whiz kids, right? Uh, they're great at school. Uh, they're surrounded by books and, and a computer and a basketball. Um, so apparently they're, they're good at uh, sports as well. Um, and again, this is a kind of the stereotypical image of the model minority myth. Yet, uh, despite all this talk about uh, successful integration and assimilation, uh, at the same time, American, Asian Americans are never truly uh, treated as fully American. Uh, Asian Americans, uh, Korean Americans included, are somehow always kind of seen as like the perpetual foreigner. Um, so for example, I usually try to keep track of how long it has been since uh, the last time I was complimented on my English. Uh, despite you know it being my native language, and uh, for me it's been about a year. So um, you know this is a common experience for many Asian Americans. You, for some reason, get uh, um, complimented on speaking your native tongue. But it really, uh, this helps to illustrate how um, Asian Americans are perpetually seen as kind of this foreign, right? Uh, why wouldn't I speak English, right? I, I was born here, but nevertheless, uh, Asian Americans are kind of seen as this foreign presence. And uh, the idea of Asian Americans as kind of this perpetual foreigner was very visible recently um, with some of the anti-Asian violence uh, surrounding the pandemic. Uh, these are some images uh, that illustrate this, but um, 
you know, Asian Americans were uh, targeted for bringing disease from, you know, supposedly from Asia to here, despite many of these people being Asian Americans. And this really illustrates how um, Asian Americans are seen as perpetually foreigner. Um, and we have images about some of these protests against um, this anti-Asian violence. So I call it the model minority paradox because it is a paradox. Uh, it's this paradox because Asian Americans are treated as this great example of assimilation, but at the same time, never really assimilated, which makes no sense, right? Um, if we're this great example of assimilation, why, why, why are we asked about our, uh, complimented on our English, right? Um, and if, you know, why does the stereotype celebrate Asian Americans as the best America has to offer, right, for immigrants, while sim simultaneously denying a full Americanhood? So this is kind of the paradox at the core of this talk. Uh, you know, what is the explanation for uh, this um, intellectual disjuncture between uh, Asian Americans as fully assimilated and as never assimilated? So to kind of uh, understand this paradox, let's turn back the clock to trace the emergence of this myth, uh, starting with uh, the 1940s. So um, we're gonna trace uh, basically kind of the emergence of this myth um, and uh, this transition from what I call the menial minority myth to the model minority myth. So when you take a, a closer look at the actual history of uh, Asian American communities, it tells us another story. And it really differs for two of lar uh, the largest Asian American groups, uh, Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. Uh, popular depictions of Japanese Americans in the 1940s did not show a bunch of like, you know, nerdy math geniuses or well assimilated girls in front of computers wearing thick glasses, like the Ta Time Magazine article. Rather, uh, popular images of Japanese Americans in the 1940s uh, showed something akin to this. So on the left, uh, we have uh, Japanese Americans. And if you recognize the style, uh, the young man on the right is wearing uh, a style called like the zoot suit. And uh, the man on the right is uh, actually Malcolm X, uh, not uh, very much not a Japanese American, but he's wearing a zoot suit as well. And the reason is that, um, Japanese Americans were not seen as the model minority, but rather uh, they were associated with the zoot suit, which was kind of this countercultural, uh, problematic um, type of image. Uh, they were Japanese Americans were rather associated with juvenile delinquency, uh, so that their emblem wasn't a calculator and a physics textbook, but rather zoot suits, long chains, and silk shirts. And uh, the Zutsu was one that didn't represent assimilation. Uh, it actually uh, symbolized a resistance, a cultural alliance with young uh, Latino and Black Americans instead. And the Zutsu was a sign of a rejection of assimilation with white culture. So uh, in fact, Zutsuited Latinos and uh, Mexican Americans had even faced physical violence uh, in 1943 with the Zutsu riots. Uh, which was part of a larger year of racially motivated attacks. And in fact, um, Japanese Americans were very much embraced this countercultural, problematic, rebellious image. Uh, male Japanese Americans actually referred to themselves as yogore, which is a Japanese term for like the dirtbags or the filth, right? So they're not calling themselves nerds, they're calling themselves the dirtbags or the filths while wearing zoot suits. Uh, unsurprisingly, U.S. newspapers complained about these people. Uh, they, they were described as aimless, dirty Asian American youths. They were seen as rowdy, cheap, and shiftless. Uh, reporters complained, quote, I can't understand how these young kids can come out of the centers, dogged out as they are in their long coats, narrow trousers that fit tightly around their ankles, and long chains that drag almost to the ground. Um, and this is coming out of uh, Chicago. So very much, they're not the model minority. They're kind of this menial minority. Um, other newspapers went further. Uh, one quoting, um, quote, it is high time that someone educated them to the real meaning of the word Americanism. So these zoot suited Japanese American, these uh, self-proclaimed uh, uh, filth or yogore were portrayed as being um, especially susceptible to crime, delinquency, and alcoholism. Again, this is a, a far cry from the model minority myth uh, we see today. But uh, thinking about the history, it should come as no surprise that Japanese and American youth were seen as the opposite of the model minority uh, because um, you know, 
in, in the 1940s, this is what Japanese American housing looked like, right? Uh, this is a, a photo from uh, Manzanar uh, being one of the Japanese American internment camps. And uh, unsurprisingly, it should be unsurprising that they were seen as um, you know, less than model minority, the menial minority, because uh, throughout World War II, they were seen as the quote unquote fifth column. Uh, these people who were um, agents for the Japanese empire that were waiting for a chance to attack the American homeland and they just needed an opportunity to do so. So uh, this example actually comes from uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, surprisingly, and it depicts you know, Japanese Americans waiting in California, Oregon, and Washington for their signal, uh, and uh, upon which they'll use these bricks of TNT, uh, presumably to attack um, the United States, right? So it should be unsurprising that uh, Japanese Americans were not seen as the model minority at all. Um, but uh, starting with the liberation from uh, these internment camps, you start to see a new process, which um, Ellen Wu calls the process of the rehabilitation of Japanese American, uh, Japanese America, which followed uh, 1946. And this was this process where uh, Japanese Americans were uh, working on kind of rejuvenating their image uh, for their uh, reincorporation to American society. And this is where we see a lot of the tenets of the model minority myth. And for many Japanese Americans, this meant uh, re-entering American life, finding jobs, finding housing, and so on and so forth. But um, Japanese Americans faced uh, discrimination much like uh, many other uh, ethnic minorities within the United States. Uh, in particular, the practices of uh, redlining and racial covenants were something faced by Asian Americans as well. Uh, so both of these refer to practices where, that make it more difficult for ethnic minorities uh, to find housing in uh, desirable neighborhoods. And so for Japanese Americans, they were facing these barriers as well. And uh, Nikkei, another term for Japanese Americans, uh, during this time started to push a new narrative, a new image, try, trying to recreate their image uh, within American society. Um, and these often took the form of what Ellen Wu calls recovery narratives. And basically, these would be these stories about how the gumption, the hard work, the quote unquote oriental cultural values, and the persistence of Japanese Americans helped them overcome the hard times of the 1940s, conveniently ignoring that the hard times of the 1940s were internment, um, which was, uh, again, very problematic, right? But nevertheless, you see within the Japanese American communities, uh, these recovery narratives. Uh, both the Japanese American Citizen League and uh, Japanese American social scientists were a part of this effort as well. Uh, in particular, the University of Chicago's uh, sociology department uh, seemed to uh, be a champion of a lot of these recovery narratives, these triumphant narratives of how uh, Japanese Americans uh, were becoming a model minority. Uh, Setsuko Matsunaga Nishi is one example, uh, also out of the University of Chicago, PhD in sociology. Uh, she wrote a lot about these recovery narratives. And so in an attempt to liberate Japanese Americans from the quote unquote ethnic ghetto, many Japanese American sociologists wrote about, uh, you know, how Japanese culture is so unique and uh, how it has this uh, positive influence on Japanese American life. In fact, uh, many scholars compared uh, Confucian upbringing with Protestant work ethic, right? Uh, so many uh, celebrated the Protestant work ethic uh, as an explanatory tool for why uh, Western society flourished. And so uh, Japanese American sociologists and other scholars said that, oh, Confucian you know, upbringing is, is like the Protestant work ethic. Again, uh, reinforcing this model minority myth. Uh, and you see this incredible uh, transition. Japanese culture, which was once seen as defeat, deceitful, uh, was seen uh, portrayed Japanese Americans as uh, fifth columnists waiting for a chance to attack the American homeland. All of a sudden, uh, so, uh, found themselves with a new image, uh, with uh, researchers talking about "quote unquote" Oriental tact, or you know, this amazing Japanese politeness. And uh, all these scholarly works full of praise for uh, Japanese conformity and lack of assertiveness, right? And these are, uh, you know, kind of uh, central tenets to the model minority myth. So on the one hand, it's hard to blame a lot of these Japanese uh, American activists and scholars. Uh, let's be honest, no one likes being in an internment camp, right? 
Um, of course, if you were an ethnic minority uh, being recently liberated from Manzanar, uh, you would want uh, these narratives about your community to be as good as possible. But at the same time, they were problematic. Uh, in, in a way, it was um, uh, a way of separating Japanese Americans from a lot of the ethnic minorities they were associated with before, uh, Latino, Latinx, and, and uh, Black American communities. So we see the Japanese version of the model minority myth uh, was really born during this time. And it was born out of this experience of internment. So, um, and it was uh, very successful by uh, the mid to late 1960s. We see uh, that this is very much a part of the public consciousness. Uh, for example, uh, the New York Times uh, ran this uh, article uh, by a sociology professor, William Peterson, uh, who said, who entitled this Success Story Japanese American Style. And uh, he is absolutely uh, ecstatic about the success, the supposed successes of the Japanese American community and how it's, you know, it, it empowered by supposed Japanese values. He notes, quote, the Japanese Americans are better than any other group in our society, including native born whites. Uh, they have established this remarkable record, moreover, by their almost totally unaided effort. Every attempt to hamper their progress resulted in enhancing their determination to succeed. So again, uh, by the 1960s, it seems like for Japanese Americans, the model minority myth uh, was in place. And, uh, you know, the supposed Japanese cultural values, which just, you know, a, a decade and a half before were seen as uh, terrible, um, were now uh, being celebrated in the public sphere. So if that's the Japanese uh, American experience of the model minority myth. Um, I want to next turn to the Chinese version of this, the Chinese American version of the model minority myth. Now, if the Japanese uh, American version of the model mi minority myth was uh, driven by World War II and the experience of internment, the Chinese version was driven by the uh, Cold War and the Korean War. And so um, while there had been previous uh, negative depictions of Chinese Americans as coolies, as um, uncultured laborers, and so on and so forth. Um, Chinese Americans actually were welcome into the American fold uh, from 1941. You see this remarkable transition in the way that Chinese Americans were depicted uh, in 1941. So you might be asking, uh, well, what happened in 1941? Well, uh, sociology professor Rose Hum Lee, a Chinese American, uh, gives us a sense. Uh, she was actually the first Asian American to uh, become head of a sociology department. She was also the first woman uh, to become head of a sociology department. And she gives us why this was the case. Um, so writing in 1942, a year after this transition, she says, uh, quote, December 7th of 1941 has emancipated the Chinese in the United States. Well, what happened on December 7th? It was, of course, um, Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor was a transformative moment for the Japanese American community, of course, but the Chinese American community as well. Uh, Professor Lee notes, no longer do Americans think of the Chinese as mysterious Orientals from a little known land. Most of these Chinese living among them are fellow citizens. The rest of them, as well as their cousins in the old country are allies. So in other words, Pearl Harbor, this uh, singular incident uh, turned Chinese Americans from kind of this mysterious Oriental or this backwards dirty coolie into an ally in the battle of World War II. They were no longer uh, enemies, they were friends in the fight um, against um, uh, Imperial Japan. And so this actually presented ample opportunities for Chinese Americans to improve the image of both Chinese and Chinese Americans in the United States. Um, and during this period, the China presented for American media was not the communist China of Mao Zedong, but rather the nationalist China of Sun Mei Ling, um, you know, wife of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Um, you might be familiar with her, but this is an image of uh, Sun Mei Ling uh, giving an address for Congress. Um, here she is uh, with um, the First Lady uh, Roosevelt. And uh, she became a quite popular figure representing non-communist China, um, nationalist China, as an ally of the United States, um, as a partner in fighting against Imperial Japan. Uh, 
And uh, so you see this affecting the Chinese American community in the United States. By 1942, there were many Americans who wanted to repeal Chinese exclusion laws. Uh, some activists went so far to call Chinese exclusion acts our Chinese wall. In other words, um, China has the Great Wall of China. America has the Chinese exclusion laws, right? Um, and uh, you see activists arguing that the exclusion of Chinese Americans from the United States hurts the war. In fact, uh, the Japanese were happy that Americans were excluding Chinese, right? Again, uh, this was a way to build solidarity uh, between China, the Chinese American community, and uh, Americans at home. So for Americans within the US, images of Sung Mei Ling um, as the nationalist uh, Chinese representative um, and the valiant battle against the Japanese enemy, uh, these became the more prominent images uh, shaping how Chinese Americans were portrayed within the United States. But of course, uh, this would change drastically with the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950. And so in 1950, Kim Il-sung, of course, um, traverses the 38th parallel and invades the South. And as a part of this, uh, the People's Liberation Army of Communist China, which has uh, been united under communism by this point, uh, joins the battle against uh, South Korea and the United States. Of course, uh, this totally reshapes Korean history, but it reshapes Chinese American history as well. And uh, so you see in 1950, all of a sudden, Chinese Americans start to ask themselves, am I going to Manzanar too? You know, we saw during World War II that Japanese Americans got thrown into camps. Now the United States is fighting China. W when is the train going to come for me, right? When when's my ticket going to come with this bus? And when's my family going to be in Manzanar? And uh, this became a real threat. You see this in newspapers at the time. Uh, a DC area a newspaper about Chinatown in the 1950s note, quote, like others of Oriental ancestry, uh, they, in other words, Chinese Americans, remember only too well the plight of 125,000 persons of Japanese ancestry after an infamous December 7th. They cannot help but wonder if the larger community may someday turn upon them. So this puts uh, the Chinese American community in this incredibly precarious position. When am, am, when, when am I going to be stuck in Manzanar? And you see warning signs. A Chinese American was shot after being a, a, accused of being a suspected uh, communist in Texas. Um, you see a rise on assaults on Asian Americans, regardless of whether they're Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, or other um, uh, Asian ethnicity. Uh, you see a decline in Chinese Americans' businesses, right? And again, um, this just goes on to really make uh, Chinese Americans worry about uh, when it's going to be their time. And so as a result, the Chinese American community mobilizes in an effort to recuperate their public image. They don't want to go to Manzanar. They don't want to be associated with the People's Liberation Army. They don't want to be seen as the enemy because they don't want to go to Manzanar. And many of them have uh, true alliances with uh, the Kuomintang or uh, the Chinese Nationalist Party as well. So uh, amidst the Korean War Red Scare, Chinese Americans become under the spotlight. And so this becomes an opportunity for Chinese Americans to start their own model minority myth as well. And so many took it upon themselves to parade their loyalty. And when I say parade their loyalty, I mean literally parade their loyalty in actual parades. So this is one image of a parade of Chinese Americans showing their loyalty. Uh, in 1951, this is the Anti-Communist League of San Francisco. And we see some of the banners. Um, it's hard to make out some of uh, this text, but in the back, uh, we see um, a banner that says help free. And I'm guessing this is maybe Korea or nationalist China. It's, uh, the, the bottom is blocked off. We see down with red and then some text, which might, might be down with red China. Um, we do see some Chinese characters as well. Uh, this one reading, uh, uh, in, in Korean, um, you know, long live the United States, right? So these people are, are literally uh, professing uh, that uh, their loyalty to the United States in, in Chinese here. So again, uh, this totally makes sense given the historical context that uh, was um, facing 
um, Chinese Americans within the United States, including San Francisco. And so this version of the model minority myth encouraged Chinese Americans to join in the US battle against communism, um, against communism in, in China or Korea as hardworking capitalists, right? To differentiate themselves from the evil uh, Chinese communists. And for some, this meant working for the Voice of America, a, a radio broadcast funded by the United States government, which shared news overseas. And in this role, uh, Chinese Americans uh, helped create their own model minority myth. At a time when many uh, Chinese Americans worked in the service industry, like laundromats or, um, you know, were laborers, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, Chinese American writers like uh, Betty Lee Sung uh, featured stories of successful Chinese Americans in the United States, right? Uh, look, Chinese Americans are successful capitalists as well, right? And this is ironic given the fact that so many um, Chinese Americans were not successful capitalists. Um, uh, Betty Lee Song wrote A Mountain of Gold, which uh, featured images of successful, well-assimilated Chinese Americans like the model minority myth, despite the fact that this was not the case for many Chinese. And Mountain of Gold, in this case, uh, being a pun, uh, play on the words for the Chinese word for um, uh, San Francisco, which is uh, Jiu Jin Chan, uh, meaning former uh, gold mountain. And uh, the book was sold for Americans. It wasn't sold for Chinese audiences. It was sold for Americans to be like, oh, look, successful capitalists, definitely not Ch uh, communist Chinese Americans, model minority, right? And uh, th there's an irony here that uh, Sung is trying to convince Chinese themselves, Chinese Americans, that they're successful because many of them are not. So there were other ways that Chinese Americans could differentiate themselves from communist China and keep their brothers and sisters out of Manzanar as well. Uh, Jade Snow Wong uh, was one example. She was a very uh, highly successful ceramist and uh, she was able to tie together Chinese culture with American success. And she did so for audiences both in the United States and overseas. Uh, her first book was very much a pull yourself up by the bootstraps tail, except with, um, you know, a quote unquote, oriental protagonist and a female protagonist. Uh, she wrote about, oh, how, uh, you know, as a Chinese immigrant, she came to the magical land of opportunity of the United States from a poor family of 11, and she became this great internationally renowned artist, right? And she was a perfect spokeswoman. Uh, she liked to dress in ambiguously Chinese-like dresses. Uh, she uh, tended to wear something that looked kind of like a chi pao, um, and she would talk about how you know, successful Chinese Americans were. And she did seem to be like a true believer of the American dream. And as such, she becomes a, a, a perfect spokesperson for both the model minority myth, but also this idea that Asian Americans could be successful. They didn't have to become communists, right? You could come to the United States and be a successful capitalist and be like Wang. Um, and so the State Department actually translated her book into several Asian languages and sent her out on tours. Uh, this is um, Wang on tour in India. And uh, this is the dress that I mentioned, which I think it's supposed to be a chipao. It doesn't look exactly like a chipao. I think it's just supposed to be like Asian looking. And uh, to denote her status, right, as someone who's a foreign but an American spokesperson, an example of American success. And she is speaking uh, to Indians um, about her successes um, that she has found, and they seem to be listening quite well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and best of all, uh, Wang never identified racism as a problem. In her words, quote, I learned never to count on the false comfort of racial discrimination to excuse personal failure. There must be some discrimination whenever human beings live together. How easy it would be to say I was discriminated against instead of saying I did not work hard enough, right? So she is excusing all of the racial discrimination that um, Asian Americans uh, faced uh, during the time and instead um, really uh, foregrounding the fact that the United States was a welcoming home and uh, Asians could participate in capitalism as well. So that was kind of the uh, genealogy of uh, the Chinese American experience with the model minority myth. Uh, on the Japanese American side, uh, they had to deal with internment and uh, kind of 
uh, the post-internment period. Uh, for Chinese Americans, uh, the model minority myth uh, came out of fears of also being uh, thrown into Manzanar or uh, internment camps, and also worries about differentiating themselves as good minorities uh, rather than those bad Chinese minorities that were fighting in the uh, Korean War. Uh, but nevertheless, the model minority myth uh, reached a new level of importance um, in the 1960s, and this uh, came with the civil rights movement in the United States. And as the civil rights movement gained steam within the United States, especially among Black Americans, we see the model minority myth amongst Asian Americans uh, changing as well. So uh, to give you a sense of why, why this was important, um, of why Asian Americans also had to deal with um, uh, the civil, or also interacted with the civil rights movement. Um, this is one example from Ao Zedong, uh, from the Chinese Communist um, uh, newspaper party organ, uh, Xinhua News. And in this, um, Ao Zedong, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, um, gives a quote unquote statement supporting the Black American struggle against repression, which is shown on this poster on the screen. And here uh, we see some of the text. And um, here uh, Mao Zedong um, uh, criticizes American imperialism. In the green, um, uh, it's Meiji Go Jui Jo, Mi Che Guk Jui Cha in Korean, or, um, you know, American imperialists are being criticized here. And they're being criticized because what happened to uh, this figure uh, outlined in blue, uh, who is uh, Ma Ding Liu Da Jin. Um, you can probably guess who that is. That's uh, Martin Luther King. Um, and uh, Martin Luther King had been assassinated in uh, 1968. And so uh, Mao Zedong puts out this statement in support of Black Americans because uh, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, we get this, uh, the King assassination riots. Uh, these images are from Washington DC uh, that show some of the protests against uh, that followed uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, these protests uh, were scattered throughout uh, the United States. There were riots in uh, several cities, including uh, Berkeley, uh, San Francisco, uh, Oakland, shown here in Seattle and throughout um, the continental United States. And uh, this created an opportunity, and uh, this was part of a larger opportunity for uh, Mao Zedong and many within uh, the communist bloc uh, to profess solidarity with the American Black civil rights struggle. And you see a lot of propaganda coming out of the communist uh, bloc that professes to for the communists to be champions of civil rights. Uh, this is one example that shows solidarity amongst uh, people of all different um, ethnic backgrounds. Um, you know, they're um, united as the proletariat, right? And uh, so you see lots of propaganda coming out of uh, communist countries uh, that are celebrating uh, the supposed solidarity between uh, the black civil rights struggle in the US and the communist uh, agenda. And uh, Mao Zedong puts out lots of statements, including in English, in support of um, Black American civil rights and criticizing uh, US uh, white imperialism and racism as well. And uh, this is one example from 1963. And uh, for many within the United States, particularly um, many diplomats, uh, many academics, uh, and many who were within this Cold War, this caused a lot of worry because it seemed to be successful with many within the Black right, uh, Civil Rights Movement. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, one of the chief uh, leaders within the Civil Rights Movement, actually went to Communist China, and he was impressed by what he saw there. In fact, he says, uh, he gave a, a speech, and he said, quote, China, after long centuries, has arisen to her feet and leapt forward. Africa arise and stand straight, speak and think, act, turn from the West and your slavery and humiliation for the last 500 years and face the rising sun. So many within the United States are starting to worry. There seems to be a solidarity, this transnational um, solidarity between black civil rights activism and a lot of um, the third world, uh, the communist aligned world as well. 
Uh, many uh, leaders within the Black Panther Party and other um, uh, Black civil rights organizations like Elaine Brown and Huey Newton were a part of this as well. They uh, were vocal supporters of uh, the communist China um, and uh, Mao Zedong Maoism as well. Eldridge Cleaver, another uh, activist within the Black Panther Party who has a very um, unusual history. Uh, he became a conservative Republican at some point. Nevertheless, um, in 1971, is giving a, a praise of Kim Il-sung and Chuche ideology uh, because he sees that, he feels that um, Kim Il-sung's ideology is more liberating for uh, Black Americans than anything the United States has to offer, right? So I'm not saying, I, I want to uh, lay out a caveat here. It, I'm not in support of uh, Chicheism. Um, and uh, uh, communist China definitely had its issues with uh, minorities as well. We see this very much with uh, Xinjiang and the Communist Chinese Party today. But what I am saying is that this was a true concern for many um, within the Cold War, within the United States. So uh, from a Cold War perspective, if uh, communist China and a lot of the communist bloc can offer this version of propaganda, where um, uh, all different minorities are um, kind of united and they experience equality and they can fight against uh, racism and imperialism, what does the United States have to offer? What, how can they counterbalance this narrative uh, that the third world, uh, that uh, the communist bloc is putting out? Well, for the United States, um, for many diplomats, for many within the Cold War, this is their answer. Successful Asian Americans, right? They're successful capitalists. They assimilate. Uh, they don't protest, right? They're not activists. They're not problematic. They learn English well. You know, they go to school. They pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And so they enjoy the fruits of capitalist society. And uh, Asian Americans are, are very useful in this sense, right? Uh, you know, Asian American uh, or American capitalist wealth is not a white man's only club. Asians can join in this too. Look at the Asian Americans, right? So this becomes a counterpoint to a lot of the propaganda um, coming out of the communist world. Um, the model minority myth amongst Asian Americans is a counter propaganda uh, coming from the capitalist world. And uh, Ellen Wu in The Color of Success uh, states this uh, succinctly uh, stating, quote, state authorities, academicians, cultural producers, and common folk renovated Asian Americans per speed differences from liability to asset. Um, in, within the worldwide decolonization movement, uh, cold warriors had this dilemma of differentiating their own imperial uh, imperium from the persona non grata of European empires. As non-whites, the entrance of Asian Americans into the national fold provided a powerful means for the United States to proclaim itself a racial democracy and thereby assume the leadership of the free world, framing US hegemony abroad as benevolent. Now, this is a, a handful, uh, it's a mouthful, but basically uh, Ellen Wu is um, uh, highlighting how within the Cold War, um, the United States could differentiate itself from uh, the European empires which colonized people of color. The United States can, could portray itself as a place welcoming for people of color who could uh, become uh, successful and could enjoy the fruits of American society as long as they assimilate. And uh, Asian Americans were only all too happy uh, to become a part of this and in many ways did enjoy the fruits of uh, this model minority myth becoming incorporated into American society and becoming uh, economically successful as well. That being said, it's problematic, right? Um, because uh, in many ways, uh, this is also being uh, built uh, by trying to differentiate uh, Asian Americans from Black American civil rights movements. Uh, Martin Luther King himself was, you know, portrayed as a, as a communist, right? And so, uh, Asian Americans and the model minority myth are being used as kind of a foil. Uh, as uh, being compared against those more problematic other minorities, right? Um, and again, for Asian Americans, it's, it's a tough decision to make uh, when you know, you know that um, Asian Americans could end up in internment camps.
So um, first off, I'd like to reiterate that um, the bulk of this uh, historical context comes from Ellen Wu's work, The Color of Success. It's an excellent um, history of the model minority myth, and I would highly recommend it. Um, she's an excellent scholar, one who I um, uh, admire a lot. But from here, um, I'd like to add my own editorial voice and think about the path forward uh, through these conclusions. So first of all, I'd like to reiterate that um, this history kind of uh, foregrounds or highlights how the model minority myth is prescriptive and not descriptive. In other words, the model minority myth is being um, articulated in a way not to describe what has been done, but to tell Asian Americans what they should do, right? And the, the narrative is that Asian Americans are happy and successful because they follow the rules, right? They're, they're not problematic, they don't protest, right? They follow the rules, so you should follow the rules too. And uh, Asian Americans are successful because they work hard and they don't rock the boat. So in other words, don't rock the boat. The Asian uh, American model minority myth um, discourages Asian American activism, political activism. It discourages protest, right? Assimilate, don't protest, right? That's kind of the story uh, behind this. And so the path forward for Asian Americans and Korean Americans must be predicated on political activism, not assimilation. So for, um, again, this is my editorial voice, but for me, progress for Korean Americans and Asian Americans in general is not going to come from learning to speak English better or collecting more academic accolades or having a more diligent Protestant work ethic. Uh, progress for Asian Americans and Korean Americans is going to come from political activism. It's not gonna come from being better Americans, right? You know, we've tried for decades. Um, it's gonna come from political activism. And for this, uh, black civil rights activists and Asian American activists are allies. Uh, we are facing uh, many similar uh, barriers and in many ways our, our goals overlap. And uh, by placing Asian American activism or Korean American activism and black activism together, it makes sense because in many ways, Asian Americans are um, benefits or benefit from the legacy of black civil rights activism. The activism of civil rights uh, leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. helped to enable Asian American success. Um, my dad came to the United States to go to Princeton, but he did his PhD in the South. And if it wasn't for Martin Luther King Jr., he might have had to drink from a colored fountain. We don't know, right? So Asian Americans um, benefit from the legacy of black civil rights activism. So I think um, it's imperative that um, Korean American activism and Asian American activism understand this legacy and understand that we are natural allies um, in, the, in the fight against discrimination. Asian Americans face the, many other practices, similar practices that Black uh, Americans face, like redlining and racial covenants, right? So we are natural allies uh, with this, within this um, uh, activism for equality. And the final thing I, I'd like to note is that the model minority myth is essentializing and it's ahistorical. Uh, the model minority myth really foregrounds how, uh, because of Confucianism somehow, that Asian Americans are more harmonious or something, and that's why we don't protest, or that's why we're not politically active, and that's why we work hard and became successful in the United States, which of course is not the truth. And in fact, if you know anything about Korean history, you know the idea that Koreans don't protest, that they are um, respectful of authority is totally false. Uh, there are tons of historical examples of protest in Korean history, right? If I think really hard, I can come up with, you know, maybe one or two examples of protest and political activism in uh, Korean history, right? Park um, Geun-hye, um, the beef protests, um, 1987, um, 1980, Gwangju. I mean, Korean history is full of protests, right? Uh, it's full of uh, political activism. It's not, it's, there's not, nothing essential about Korean culture that prevents Koreans from be, being politically active or protesting uh, when, the, when they see uh, injustice, right? So, uh, you know, similarly, um, it, it seems natural that uh, Korean Americans and Asian Americans uh, become politically active 
uh, that there's nothing essentially Confucian about uh, our communities uh, that prevent us from uh, political activism uh, and um, or, or even protest when necessary. So um, that concludes my talk, but this is a, a natural point to plug in um, or uh, reiterate that this talk is a follow-up uh, from Connie Chung Jo's uh, talk um, for Asians Advancing Justice, um, uh, Asian American Rights Organization. Um, you know, when I say that uh, political activism is the path forward, I think her organization is one um, that I, I would personally recommend. Uh, they are doing good work, and uh, Friends of Korea has done good work with their organization as well. So, um, you know, if this talk does uh, somehow uh, convince you that there needs to be more Korean American uh, activism, uh, her organization is one place to turn. But uh, thank you uh, for coming out on a, uh, you know, uh, I know on the East Coast is quite late for you all, but uh, thank you for attending the talk. And uh, I will take any questions that we might have from uh, either the moderators or the audience. All right, so I'll start off um, as a moderator. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Danny, for a really fascinating talk. Um, I learned a lot, like learning about the, the historical legacies that have brought us to today. So um, before I turn it over to the audience for questions, um, if you're in the audience, just for the sake of you know, minimizing chaos with different people trying to talk, if you could please put your question in the chat and then I will read it out. Um, then we don't have to worry about any technical issues as well. So um, please keep that in mind, you know, put your questions in there for Danny. I'm sure everybody has a lot of um, things that they're interested in about. Um, but just to transition us into that, the Q&A session, um, one of the things that I got out of your talk, Danny, was this very cyclical nature of some of these you know, moments when um, there were tensions, moments when there were concerns. So, you know, some the the culture found a way to turn that right and to use Asian Americans in different ways um, in to make them useful to what uh, the the mainstream culture wanted at that moment. And I think that we're seeing that again now, right? We're seeing a lot of this cycle coming back again. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, the time period we're in now and, and how you see some of this playing out uh, in our current um, co uh, country. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, racial stereotypes are, are useful for several reasons. Um, scapegoating is, is one, right? And um, unfortunately, that, that's, that's a cycle we saw with um, Japanese internment of uh, Japanese Americans. And we actually saw that, uh, unfortunately, very recently, um, even uh, before um, this recent outbreak of anti-Asian um, sentiment uh, regarding the um, uh, pandemic. So if you recall, under the previous administration, there was a family separation policy. And uh, there, there were actually people who supported the, the family separation policy who used um, Japanese internment as um, an excuse justifying why uh, family separation was okay. Uh, we've put people in internment camps before, so we can do it again. That's a very, very unfortunate uh, reading of uh, Japanese American history. And hopefully this talk um, uh, reiterates how, really drives home what a devastating impact that had on, not just for Japanese Americans, but for Korean Americans. Uh, during World War II, you see Korean Americans wearing badges. I, I am Korean, right? Because you don't uh, want to end up in Manzanar. And we see how it um, uh, reshaped uh, the Chinese American community as well, right? They're, during the Korean War, they, they don't want to go to Manzanar, right? So, um, but unfortunately, we see these things coming back, right? Um, with uh, the justification for family separation while using uh, Japanese internment as an excuse. And then of course, uh, Asian Americans and Asians getting scapegoated um, for the, uh, some of this pandemic as well. So again, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, racial, racial stereotypes can be very politically expedient. Uh, 
And that's something we saw in Korean War, in World War II, and unfortunately more recently as well. So again, uh, I'd also like to reiterate, that's why political activism is important. Just trying to be the best American that you can be and, and hoping that society accepts you, that, that is not the path forward. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, so once again, please put your questions in the chat, but I do have one here from Mike Travis, who's in Mount Vernon, Washington. Um, as Native Americans are dealing with decolonization to foster their successful futures, um, how are Korean Americans overcoming this model minority myth to better their lives? Yeah, so that's uh, that's a tough question. You know, um, the model minority myth, it's seductive, right? Um, it's seductive because it allows Korean Americans to monopolize uh, the credit for their success. You know, we are so successful because we worked so hard, we're collectivists, we, we study hard. Of course, those are factors, right? Um, but at the same time, there, there's this more complicated history. Um, Korean Americans really benefit from Martin Luther King Jr., from a lot of this uh, civil rights activism. In many ways, they got the fruits of that without having to pay the work, right? Um, so it's, it's seductive in many ways. So I, I think uh, Korean Americans are gonna have to come to terms with this other past. The, the reality that um, Korean Americans were discriminated against, the reality that um, we too are um, heirs to a legacy of civil rights activism that was championed by our, um, our, our, you know, our black American friends, right? So um, I think that that's something that um, I hope more um, scholarship emphasizes. Um, Ellen Wu in Color of Success, I think she does a, a good job starting this conversation. But again, I think um, this needs to be more public. More people need to know about this as well. But that's a great question. One thing I'm really curious about in, in your lecture, this came up a couple of different times in different ways, is the the connections or, or lack of connections or trying to separate from, you know, Korean Americans and Korea, Chinese Americans and China in whatever form at the time, right? Um, you know, Japanese Americans and J Imperial Japan. So at the end, I thought it was really fascinating. You were saying, you know, sometimes there's this justification that's being used that, oh, you know, because of Korean culture, this and this, but if you look at Korean politics, that's obviously not the case. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? On you know maybe this, this con these connections that are being made and and trying to be separated from you know the the countries in Asia from which these ethnic groups might have come. Yeah. So, um, excellent question. So uh, one of the challenges that um, the Asian American uh, communities uh, face within the United States is uh, again, uh, as as you mentioned. Um, uh, this ambiguity, right, uh, between um, being uh, primarily identified with their, their um, countries of origin, or rather the, their adopted home. And it, it actually becomes more complicated because of the Cold War. Because uh, when, um, you know, Wang or uh, Li, uh, some of these authors are being paraded for as model minorities, they're being paraded not as fully assimilated Americans, but icons that represent China, right? Um, so it creates this ambiguity, right? Because they're, they're tokens of Chineseness, even if they are fully assimilated Americans, because they need to portray their Chineseness to the rest of the world. Uh, Wang has to be Chinese. A, a white American cannot fulfill her role within diplomacy because um, everyone knows that you know white Americans be, can be successful. She has to be a token of, of you know quote unquote yellow success, right? So she gets paraded as a Chinese, even when it's not authentically Chinese, her chi pao was not that was not a, a real chi pao, right? So um, so this creates another layer of ambiguity between um, your, you know, many of these communities, Asian American identities and uh, their Asian origins. So uh, this is a challenge, right? This is a challenge. Um, many uh, Asian Americans, you know, such as myself, primarily um, identify with their, the American side of their identity, um, whereas others don't. But at least when uh, the model minority myth comes into play, the framework of the model minority myth um, 
inherently encourages ambiguity there, right? Um, they're not pre being presented 100% as Americans because they need to be presented to outside of the United States. Yeah, great question. That, that actually leads me well into one other question that I had, which was, you know, another of these themes that kept coming up again, and you talked about it at the end is, is kind of pitting groups against each other, right? And um, one of the things I was thinking about as you were giving your talk to is the Supreme Court case that I believe should be decided soon on affirmative action that was brought by a group of Asian American plaintiffs yeah. against affirmative action. Um, so yeah, can you can you just elaborate a little bit more on on these dividing lines that that have been created? Yeah. So again, that that is a tough issue because um, many uh, Asian American activist groups, um, I, I empathize with the, with their position. I, I don't agree, but um, they are doing things like uh, fighting affirmative action, right? Um, and it's uh, unfortunately it's driven out of a, a sense that. Um, Asian Americans are, are somehow entitled or um, that uh, they're being discriminated against because there's this forgotten history of alliance between um, Asian American activism and Black American activism. So I think, um, the, you know, at the end, it's, it's an alliance that uh, many minorities within the United States share the same goal. Unfortunately, uh, many Asian Americans themselves and also you know, uh, people within the State Department and other academics have drawn this artificial line between uh, Asian Americans as a minority and everyone else, right? And uh, that was strategic. Um, from the Asian Americans point of view, it was strategic because they don't want to go to Manzanar. Uh, from the US, um, Diplomatic point of view, it's strategic because they don't want um, Asia <laughs> to become communist, right? So, um, but unfortunately it creates division. So um, one reason that I think this type of history is important is that it reminds the Asian American community that, um, you know, a lot of, as activists, we are allies. Our, our goals are um, equality. Um, a more fair and equitable society. The path forward to that is cooperation with Black Lives Matter, uh, with Black civil rights activists. Um, and uh, the path forward is not more assimilation, speak English better, get your GRE scores even higher. I mean, that, that's not, your, uh, Koreans are not gonna get, uh, Korean Americans are not gonna get equality that way. All right, we're almost out of time. Um, Mike Travis has one more question and then I think we'll wrap up. Is that okay? Sounds good. Um, so this is from, from Mike Travis. Um, he's mentioning, you know, Alaska natives are reviving some of their uh, the parts of their culture in order to, you know, push forward and, and find uh, act their activism now. Um, do you see a path forward like that uh, for Korean Americans going back to, to their roots in order to move forward in some of these ways you're talking about? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, where so the question of uh, whether uh, Korean Americans can try to reclaim certain parts of their identity as as a way of kind of unifying their sense of um, um, collaboration. Or, um, yeah, so uh, as far as that goes, I, I mean, I think um, in many ways, um, you know, Korean American groups are, are doing that to some extent. Um, you see celebrations of you know, Korean American culture and, and so on and so forth. And the recent, um, I believe Biden just signed um, a bill enabling the creation of an Asian American um, museum, historical museum. Um, so that's another step of uh, trying to you know, reclaim some of this history and uh, create a better sense of solidarity. I hope they do it in a sensitive way that also emphasizes how the, the cooperation between um, Asian Americans and other um, ethnic minorities and that doesn't perpetuate the model minority myth. Uh, that, that's my hope for this museum. But yeah, that's, that's a great question. There are you know museums and other organizations that are doing work like that. 
Okay, Danny, thank you so much. I personally learned a lot. I, I hope that the audience feels the same way. Um, Jerry, do you have anything you want to say about Friends of Korea before we go or? Uh, yeah, yes, I would. And, and if I can call you Danny, Professor Kim, Danny's on the board also, I might want to add for Friends of Korea. We're so delighted to have him on the board too. Thank you very much for your presentation tonight. And to our audience, I just want to say we're planning more uh, programming uh, for this summer in July and August and September. Uh, we hope to have one of our virtual, our proven to be very popular, our virtual uh, socializing events, a virtual gathering too. But to we want to continue this theme about the Asian American experience. We hope to bring the uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, back in September for a workshop as well too. So um, as far as Friends of Korea, a uh, couple of things to keep up with the programming, always uh, you know, visit the website. I know most of you here are members in the chat. I'll put the link in. Uh, but uh, I would like to bring to your attention too, uh, nominations for the Kevin O'Donnell Award are due by July 31st. And that is to honor individuals or, or organizations that have made um, distinguished contributions to uh, building relationships uh, between Koreans and Americans, not only within the United States, but across uh, both countries as well. So please go to the uh, Friends of Korea website for more information on that and uh, feel free to nominate someone. Someone doesn't have to be a distinguished scholar. You know, we're not looking for that. We're looking for individuals who are perhaps silently working behind the scenes to build these uh, relationships. So. Um, and I also might want to add, if you find this kind of programming interesting, which I do, our membership is quite affordable. And uh, particularly if you want to sponsor someone, to sponsor a student is $10, to sponsor a, a, an adult member is $25. And of course, the um, membership, the lifetime membership is $250 as well, too. So just on behalf of Friends of Korea, Danny, thank you very much. Jenna, thank you very much. Katarina, thank you very much. And everybody in the audience tonight, I want to thank you very much for attending tonight.